So today we're very lucky to have somebody with us from an international organization from Microsoft. Now uh, I know that we're not strictly following the, the sequence of the industries that we cover in the careers book as per the syllabus. I know you all religiously follow the syllabus and you know this. But international organizations is not the first industry or sector that is covered. However, the way we're going to do it is depending on who I can bring in to speak uh, for us from whichever sector, that's what we're going to start with. So this is going to be actually the second industry, I think, which is in your book, which you're also going through the readings. It's international organizations. And that's what we're going to be beginning at least our speaker series for the rest of the semester with. All right, I'm going to let Josh McIntyre um, introduce himself and talk a little bit more about himself. He does it a lot better. Please feel free to throw up your hand and ask questions. Josh is a very uh, lively person. He loves engaging students. Uh, he's very good at what he does. So use this opportunity. Also, this is an opportunity to network. Remember, we talked a lot about networks. So definitely approach him at the end of the lecture if you have any further questions or if you just want to share your contact details. And, um, and I'm sure he'll be very happy to and also be happy to tell you more about what he does outside of his job at Microsoft. All right? So without further ado, Josh. Yes, please be friendly. I'd love to talk to all of you after. Uh, and feel free to throw up your hand, ask questions during the presentation. There's no strict rules about that or anything. So yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Um, again, my name is Josh McIntyre. So uh, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, which is obviously a very large international organization. We have over um, 100,000 employees across the world. Uh, I'm actually based here in Pittsburgh. We do have an office here that's uh, somewhat small, but if you're looking for you know, a contact there, feel free to reach out. And uh, outside of my job at Microsoft, I do a lot of work with global sort of decentralized technologies. Uh, the big thing that brings me into speaking opportunities is actually Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, if any of you are familiar with that. So if you're interested in that, definitely ask me about it. And what we're going to be talking about today is not Bitcoin, so don't worry, you won't be bored out of your skull if you're not into that. But I want to talk about some of the skills you can use to kind of steer your career and find your path and advocate for yourself in your job as you're um, you know, coming up through your studies and coming out of college. As you can probably tell, I'm pretty young. I'm actually only two years out of school. So there's a lot of interesting things that you can do when you're young in the industry to get yourself out there and you don't have to feel like you have to have 20 years of experience to do really interesting things with your, with your field of study. And then I want to steer a little bit and talk about applying some of the skills that you're learning as folks that are studying international relations to the field of technology and why we need people that think in a really globally minded way uh, in the industry that I work in in particular. So again, I'm a software engineer at Microsoft, and if any of you are interested in the really nerdy cryptocurrency stuff or you know, sort of those global borderless decentralized technologies, I run a website called uh, Chain Tutorials, chaintuts.com. Uh, I create videos, articles, code projects, and I go around to conferences and colleges like this and speak on that topic. So I'm out on social media and on the web. Please feel free to contact me and interact with me there. I'm always happy to talk to people about their interests in that space. So I think based on what I do for a living and what I'm interested in, I do have some interesting perspectives on working with global technologies and kind of working in the international relations side of things. So let's start off with some more generic career thoughts. And I think this might be different than some of the stuff that you normally hear because it's coming again from somebody that's pretty young and early on in their career, and I, I hope it's useful in that sense. So the first thing that I really want to encourage you to do that I don't think necessarily gets talked about enough is really pursuing your passions outside of your job. Uh, and I mean two things by that. It can be things that are in your field that maybe they're sort of passion projects outside of what you do that pays the bills. And also doing things that have nothing to do with what you do for a living. So personally, um, you know, I like having a job that challenges me. At Microsoft, I work on sort of full stack web development stuff for a file systems product. It's really interesting and challenging in a lot of ways, uh, but it's not necessarily the tech niche that gets me the most fired up either. So outside of work, what I do with Chain Tutorials, it really has nothing to do with what I do for my day job. Uh, what I do at Microsoft has nothing to do with cryptocurrencies, blockchains, decentralized technologies, but it's something that I really love and so I take a lot of time outside of my 40-hour work week to pursue that. 
And it's been really, really good for me, actually, as a professional software engineer, even though it doesn't have much to do with the technologies that I work on daily, because it keeps me passionate about the field. Much like being in school, you might really love it, you might really love your job, but there's always challenges, there's always up days, there's always down days, sometimes when you're stressed, frustrated, you know, it happens in any job. But having something to work on a lot that is just pure passion really keeps me excited about what I'm doing in that industry. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have something that just, when I get home, I can completely turn off work, but I don't have to turn off computer science. I can be working on something that I care about, and it keeps me excited about the field. You know, it depends a lot on the industries that you're in, but a very particular problem that happens in computer science is burnout. Uh, our industry is notorious for taking people that love what they do and turning them into zombies within a couple years because it's really, really hard work. And I want to encourage you to work on things that allow you to not become a zombie within a couple years. I want you to love what you do. That is more important than any amount of pay that you could get, any amount of benefits that you can get. You need those things too. You know, I don't want you to not have a nice living, but you should find a way to make money doing what you like because it doesn't become work then so much. And I want you to pursue things that have absolutely nothing to do with your job, paying bills, the industry you're in, or anything like that. Outside of work, I'm super active. Uh, I love to come home from work some days, completely shut off the computer, shut off my phone. I play in adult ice hockey leagues. Uh, I do jujitsu. I like to ski, bike, just keep myself moving. It's really good to you know get away from that. And, you know, that kind of sounds like the generic advice of like, yeah, exercise is good for you. But it really goes a lot deeper than that. If you have a passion for something, whatever that thing might be, especially if it's you know something active that keeps you healthy, that does way more for your mental health and your physical health than you might think it does. And that's actually really important for your career. So I want to hit home the point that things that you love that you do outside of work are good for your career. Because again, burnout. You don't want to be physically weak and you know, have health problems because you're just stressed and focusing on work all the time. So if you like playing hockey, if you like doing martial arts, if you, you know, like playing video games, do that. Get yourself away from your career for a while. It's actually good for what you do for a living. The second thing, networking is so, so, so important for your career. And you've probably heard that before, but I can tell you some interesting stories from personal experience of how networking has helped me get to sort of what I'm doing today. So my current job at Microsoft, I got in a very interesting fashion. Uh, when I was in college, uh, as a sophomore, I worked at a ski rental place in Donegal, so you know, an hour up the road for anyone that's not familiar with the area, right by the local ski resorts. A gentleman came to my booth to get his skis tuned up and go out for the day wearing an Amazon Web Services t-shirt. And me being the social weirdo that I am, I said, that is really cool. I love Amazon Web Services. I like tinker with that and run websites on there. And you know, that's not a thing that a person normally says to you because it's kind of tech and niche. And he said, oh, you know, are you a computer science student? Are you a programmer? I exchanged information with him and less than two months later, I had an offer for my first internship. Simply just kind of by being social and finding the right person at the right time. Um, I had an opportunity at the end of August this year to fly out to Denver and speak at the blockchain training conference. And uh, I applied for that online, but a lot of the opportunity to do that uh, was through the fact that I've gotten myself out there by putting content online in my free time, meeting people and talking to people on social media in the Bitcoin and blockchain space. And so, Again, it's just kind of putting yourself out there. And I met people there that are now new connections for me to have opportunities to speak and develop my career as a speaker and an educator in Bitcoin and that world that I'm really interested in. And you also mentioned, because you also did it on your own dime, didn't you? So this I did. is something that you actually paid for because it was going to be so worth it. I did, know, yeah, I did invest a little bit financially in that too. So the, the blockchain training conference specifically was. Uh, sort of a, it's run by a nonprofit called the Cryptocurrency Certification Consortium. So they were not able to pay speakers or pay for expenses. So I actually paid a good bit of my own money to fly out, be up in a hotel for a couple days, you know, keep my wife occupied while she was out there with me. 
Uh, but it was worth it because I made so many cool connections and the opportunity itself, I would have spent five times that to go out and meet the people that I did. And so uh, I think overall, well this talk, okay, we met through connections at St. Vincent, which is my alma mater, uh, you know, some professor friends and had the opportunity and talking over email. So really the point I wanna make is don't be afraid to put yourself out there. It feels a little risky. You're, you're young, you don't necessarily have a ton of experience that's like that resume building. Don't worry about it. If you have skills and you have passion, you can use them in some way. Uh, especially in the tech industry, you know, people are getting away a little bit from the paper credentials, the do you have this degree in this field. If you have the ability to do something, say you have the ability to do something and, and try to do it. You know, sometimes you get told no, and that's okay, but that's really the worst thing that happens. So, you know, I want to encourage everybody to take those kind of risks. So, you know, use social media professionally. LinkedIn is great. Uh, I like using LinkedIn, and I'm not just saying that because it's a Microsoft product now. I meet and talk to a lot of people on there. You know, uh, use Twitter in a way that puts yourself out there in a space that you're interested in professionally. You know, I don't advise getting into political arguments or talking about you know, anything that you wouldn't want an employer to see on social media, but that's, you know, it's out there. If people do talk on those platforms and go to meetups. Uh, another networking opportunity that I had is I went to a brand new meetup called Blockchain in the Berg. And the ladies that run it are fantastic and super passionate about what they do. I talked to them, shared that same really deep interest in, in that subject of cryptocurrency. And they invited me to come back and give a talk at the, at the very next one. So, you know, getting involved with local uh, meetups that are in subjects that you're interested about. If they have a local IR meetup or, you know, maybe a language learning meetup or something that applies to what you like to do. Don't be afraid to go out. You know, if you go out for a night and you go to a restaurant and meet and you're just not that into it, you don't have to come back. But it can't hurt to spend some time doing that. And most of all, this is the most important thing. Don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. You don't have to be outgoing to network. I don't, I don't want to scare anyone in the room when I'm talking about networking and self-advocacy to think that you have to be a super extroverted, bubbly person. Like, I'm definitely that kind of person. That's why I like doing what I'm doing now. You don't have to be that kind of person to advocate for yourself. Put your skills out in front of people in a way that makes sense for you. So if you're you know, somebody that's maybe more comfortable using social media or LinkedIn, you're a better writer than you are a speaker, Use that to your advantage. Talk to people online. Publish papers. Self-publish your, your first book on a subject that you're interested in. Uh, and I'll say, for example, in, in a subject that's near and dear to me, uh, in 2009, a person named Satoshi Nakamoto, or Persons, released a white paper in a, in, in a initial software version for a technology called Bitcoin. This is my favorite thing in the world. Um, I personally think this is completely changing the world of finance and is a way bigger deal than we can even realize here in the first 10 years of this. We don't know who they are. We don't know if Satoshi is one person, if it's many people, we still have no idea. This person has released this life-changing, society-changing technology and fell off the face of the earth. And I think that really hits home that this person advocated for a project that they felt very passionate about. They put it out for the world to see and for people to use. and. They're not going around touring and selling books about it. So find what works for you and put yourself out there. Your skills are valuable, whether you think they are or not. The imposter syndrome is real, uh, especially in my field in software engineering. I know many times people I work with, and myself included, feel like we don't belong to be where we are, and oh, we can't possibly be that good, and everybody else is better than us. Don't let that get to you. You know, Don't be afraid to uh, be a person that's putting yourself out in front of the world with the skills that you have and continuing to develop develop that skill set. So now I kind of want to shift a little bit from the kind of generic career advice and talk a little bit about international relations and technology because I think that the field of tech in the broad sense, whether that's hardware devices, software products, you know, communication tools, really, really benefits from people that are doing what you're doing and what you're studying. So I'm not a person with an international relations background. I, I have a computer science degree, I'm a software engineer, I write code every day, and I go around speaking about magic internet money. 
Um, but this is a field that can really, I think, uniquely benefit from people like you that uh, care about thinking with a global mindset. So I want to talk about some of the technologies that are out there and some of the reasons that international relations is important in that field. Because I think it can kind of plant some seeds for things that you might be interested in working on in the future. So again, there's, there's no industry right now that is more global than computing. And this goes beyond the corporate world. Software projects are changing the fabric of society and some of them are changing society and not making any money whatsoever. <laughs> So uh, this goes beyond you know, working for Microsoft or Google. This could be contributing to open source, contributing to nonprofit software projects, all those things. So software used to be local. In the very early days of computing, you bought a physical PC. I mean, you still do that, right? But you bought a physical PC, you put a disk in there, and sometimes like a floppy disk, depending on how old you are. You installed some software. Wait, can we actually take a, how many of you have ever used floppy disks? We're old enough to use floppy disks. Yeah, that's, that's not fun. necessarily surprising. I was definitely, I mean, they were, my computer had a floppy drive. Yeah, you're two years on. older than them, that's yeah. true. <laughs> I keep forgetting, okay, my bad. No, I'm not old people yet. <laughs> hey. I didn't say you were old. But, you know, this software was a local thing. You just installed a piece of software, it was an application that was on your computer and you used it. It didn't communicate with servers, it didn't do, there, wasn't, there was no internet. That's all it was. And then the internet came along. And networks grew exponentially and they grew very quickly beyond national borders. There are no borders on the internet. And so, you know, information can travel internationally instantaneously. Fiber optic cables under the Atlantic Ocean you can send a message to somebody in Europe right now and it is there before you can link. And so this has changed the fundamental design concerns of software and, and technology products. Like what we're building as engineers is totally different than it was 20 or 30 years ago because everything is now for an international audience. So there's two sort of segments I think this kind of falls into. There is the corporate and commercial software development and there's the free and open source decentralized technologies that are really just looking to make an impact on society and they have sort of a value proposition. So people are working on them as a community. So working for global tech companies is definitely something that you could do and apply your skills to. So somebody like Microsoft, we have people that work, you know, their job is dedicated to making sure that software is localized, software is accessible, those sorts of concerns. Oftentimes, products are now actually web applications. So a lot of software now isn't a thing that you install a, you know, a binary package software onto your machine. You actually just go to a website and it's a piece of software that runs in your web browser. You know, Twitter, Facebook, uh, those are prime examples of that. They're not just websites with static information, they're web applications. And so if you have a product that anybody can get on the internet and get to from anywhere, you have to be ready for that. So um, some installed software as well, they're still global products, like Microsoft Word or something like that. If you install it on your PC somewhere else in the world, it might sense the region that you're in, and it's going to uh, behave in a way that's localized. So it's going to give you local language suggestions, say in Spanish instead of in English, if you're in Spain. You know, software has to be designed for the non-English speaking world that we're accustomed to. And so the U UI and UX, those are uh, terms for user interface design and user experience. Those concerns are really important to understand. And folks from your background actually are very important for understanding those concerns and building software correctly. So localization goes beyond just Google Translate. It's not just a language thing anymore. Uh, the industry needs personnel that actually understand deep cultural differences and political concerns in different parts of the world. So one of the things when I joined Microsoft that kind of blew me away is, uh, for example, we have an internal tool that we use called PolyCheck. When we create something that's user facing, we can actually take the output of that, so say a web page, and run it through a database that cross references for politically sensitive terminology. So there are you know, sort of turns of phrase that we use in English and might use in the United States that aren't necessarily offensive language, like in the ways that language can be really deeply offensive to somebody, 
but they, um, they're politically sensitive. Terminology like hung, for example, for like a process hung, that, that can actually be really sensitive for somebody in an area of the world where that is used as like a method of public execution or something like that. Like we don't think of that necessarily, but those, th that terminology can be really hurtful to somebody that's in a part of the world where that's a problem. So that's a user interface and a user experience concern when designing international software. So again, we need people that understand you know, political differences, cultural differences across the world and not just in the culture that the engineers designing the software come from. Um, legal and privacy concerns. This is a really big one that people have probably heard about. Uh, the general data protection regulation that just went into place in Europe. Um, Microsoft designs all of our software to comply with this now. Like my team in Pittsburgh is designing stuff that's used a lot of times in the US, but we're just by default complying with GDPR. And a lot of companies are doing this because these are strict regulations about uh, how you can store personal user data, how uh, you have to allow users to access information that is stored about them and request that it's removed. And this is something where you know you might have lawyers in the US that aren't super well equipped to deal with this, but if you have some you know IR people that you know have some international law familiarity or that sort of thing, or an you know at least a general understanding of these regulations, that's important. You want to have people that can think about the implications of your product legally across a broad spectrum of countries. So now this is the sort of segment of technology that's most near and dear to me, and that's free and open source and decentralized technology. So FOSS is an acronym, acronym for free and open source software. This is software that's not just free as in free beer, I know everybody loves free beer, but it's also free as in freedom, like you know, eagles flying and all that imagery uh, that might also be politically sensitive, right? Uh, it's the idea that you can take a piece of software you have access to the code, you can modify it, you can study it, you can do anything that you want with it. That is in contrast to commercial software, like Microsoft Windows is a commercial software license, Microsoft Word is a commercial software license. You don't get to see the code, you don't really know what it does because you can't audit it. With open source technologies and truly free and open source licenses, you can take it, you can have your buddy in the CS department actually read the code and see what it does, and you're allowed to modify it, you can sometimes sell it, like it doesn't have to be free as in free beer. You can actually even sell open source software. And a lot of these projects are geared towards solving worldwide problems. So again, of course, my favorite one is cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Bitcoin Cash, all of those. There, that project was not put out there for financial gain. It was put out to solve a, the problem of se, you know, uh, censoring of transactions, of you know, expensive transactions going across borders and taking a lot of time to process. And so uh, even things like other privacy tools, these are really important things and they're always in need of knowledgeable contributors on the side of you know, making the software compatible with an international audience. So something like Bitcoin solves the problem of, you know, if you're a migrant worker and you want to send money to your family back home, Western Union is going to charge you 30 out of that $100. It's going to take six days to get there. It's slow, it's inefficient, it just stinks. Bitcoin is going to get it in their wallet instantly, fully verified, like, you know, a clear check in about 10 to 30 minutes and for minimal fees. And that is really amazing and revolutionary in my opinion. It is completely decentralized and censorship resistant. So our normal money, we have the Federal Reserve, we have a central institution that controls the supply of money. We have central institutions called banks that process transactions. And so all of this is solved in a really unique and interesting way with a piece of open source software. I'm not going to sit here and talk about all the technical aspects, right? It's not what we're here for. But this is a this is a community-driven software project that solves completely international problems. Tor browser, actually, believe it or not, started within the walls of the U.S. government, but is a completely open-source project developed by a community. Allows anonymous internet access. 
Now, I'm guessing most of the people in this room aren't really too worried about people watching what they do on the internet, right? It's a free country. You know, you can generally do and view what you want. Uh, other folks around the world are not so lucky. Uh, their internet flow is censored. They are not allowed to say certain things for fear of severe repercussions. And so Tor, without, again, going into the software details, allow you to anonymously access the internet, and no one except for you sitting right there in front of your browser can see what you're looking at. So this is critical for applications like whistleblowing, uh, accessing forbidden materials, journalism. It protects your privacy, and, and therefore, in places where this is a serious concern, it protects your physical safety. The list of these types of projects that solve these problems that span across borders goes on and on and on. There are so many that I could talk about, but these are two that I find really interesting, especially the cryptocurrency stuff. So they're solving problems that exist internationally. Censoring of speech, the censoring of information flow, privacy, financial sovereignty, even just lack of resources. And these are projects that are out there that anybody can contribute to and become involved with. So this goes beyond people like me that are computer scientists and engineers. We need translators. I bet many of you in here as international relations students have foreign language skills. We need people with marketing savvy that can build the brand for an open source project. You know, make sure it looks good like a commercial product. It makes more people want to use it. Uh, we need people with international law and political savvy. You know, even technologies like encryption are subject to certain regulations in certain countries. And so having people that understand how to get these products out there, get these projects out there in a way that complies with local laws as much as you know, is reasonable and moral, uh, that's really important. So some final thoughts to give you before I completely open it up to questions. Everything is tied to technology now. I know we as millennials are sick of hearing this. We just can't put down our phones, right? And our avocado toast. <laughs> but everything that we do, from our banking, how we communicate with each other, how we put new information and products and resources out there for the rest of the world, it's tied to technology. It's not just being used for profit, which is a fine motivation, but it's really being used for social good. And the companies and the independent organizations that are developing these technologies really need people that understand international concerns. I can't say this enough. We need people that are not just engineers. We need people that are translators and lawyers and marketing people and that just understand what it is to build a product that can impact people outside of our sort of little bubble that we live in sometimes. And the last thing that I want to say really ties back to the general career advice that I said earlier. You have skills. You might not think you do, but you're here at a great institution of higher learning. You're all very intelligent individuals. I know that because you're here. Um, you have passions and interests, and you need to pursue them. Don't let any perception of your youngness or lack of experience or lack of skill stop you from putting yourself out there. So. Again, pursue what interests you. Take the time to do that. Take the time to care for yourself. Uh, network. Put yourself out there in a way that is comfortable for you, whether you're you know, sort of an extroverted person or you're not. There are technologies that can make it work for you. And finally, don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. Put yourself out there. Be proud of who you are and the skill set that you have. And apply it to something that you care about. That's what gets you to a good place early on in your career. I find myself to be very, very fortunate to get to do what I do. Not only do I get to go to a day job that I love for 40 hours a week, I get to put out content online that people find interesting. I get to come speak to students and people at conferences, which I love every single opportunity to do. And that's all, not at all, because I am an expert or a seasoned industry veteran with two years of experience or anything like that. It's just because I decided that I had a passion for this and that I was going to pursue it and I was going to advocate for myself and put myself out there. So thank you so much and I would love to take a, as many questions as we can fit in.
that. It was very informative. I certainly learned a lot, and I think we we also touched on issues, you know, in your career slides that we've sort of hinted at, but we never really got into, like never underestimate being passionate about something when you're doing it, but also the importance of, of doing something that you love outside of work and caring for yourself as opposed to just focusing 100% on the work aspect. So we have some time for questions and some discussion. So who would like to ask a question? How about it? Don't be shy. <laughs> Go for it. What do you think of Monero? Monero? Uh, well, I'm a big fan of privacy. Um, I can, you, can you tell those of us that have no idea what Monero is? Yes, so Monero is another cryptocurrency. There are many different cryptocurrencies that are out there. Um, Monero is another decentralized, you know, peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency that is designed specifically for privacy. So Monero has technology built into it such that when you transact from person to person, like, you know, you send money to you and you, nobody can see uh, what the transaction actually was, like who sent one to who. There's some cryptography that goes into that that I'm not well versed in. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have a super deep opinion on that other than I'm a big fan of privacy and anything that protects privacy. Uh, there's so many cryptocurrencies out there, so I focus my attention and what I write content on and study to Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. None of those have super native uh, privacy built in. But there are some technologies that are coming out, like Cash Fusion, CoinJoin, that uh, you know make it so that your transactions are more private. That is important. So, hope that kind of answers your question. So, I, I I love the idea. I don't have a ton of really domain-specific knowledge on Monero, but I I know people that do uh, that really like it. This is kind of the same on the idea of an opinion question here. But do you are you ever concerned that? Uh, Cryptocurrencies, especially like Bitcoin, because it's so popular, could kind of become the next Silk Road in a way where you can't really track. Like, at what point does? At what point do you prioritize uh, privacy over? Yeah. It's sort of the privacy over security. So I want to put my bias out there right up front. I'm actually in a in a sort of a, a, a weird way. I'm really big fan of what the Silk Road did. To be honest. Um, I think that the drug war and all of that sort of thing, you know, without going into politics, is like a total waste of humanity. And I'm like a free rosser big time. Um, the the real question though is is you know can these things be abused? They can, right? But you know you know what the number one currency for transacting in illegal activities and, and harmful activities is? Anyone, anyone would take a guess? Yeah, U.S. dollars, cash. So. Um, but we as a society certainly value our ability to like use this pretty stable US dollar and that, that's an important thing. So when it comes to my opinion on issues of privacy or over security, personally, I am far more on the privacy side of things. And that might be sort of contrary to like you know, international relations, a lot of you might be interested in working in terrorism, counterterrorism. Um, I tend towards the side of I would rather have something that's free and a little bit risky. So, like, when people are like, do people use Bitcoin to use buy drugs? I'm like, yeah, they do. <laughs> awesome, right? So, I don't know. Hopefully, that answers your question. Where are my ISF majors in this class? <laughs> uh -oh. I'm in trouble. Are you, are you, are you sort of going? <laughs> I just want to hear you. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, if it's not obvious, when it comes to, th like, obviously, um, can it be used for things that are, that are legitimately really harmful to people, like human trafficking? Um, weapons trafficking to a certain extent. Like my personal opinion, when it comes to things like drug laws, is like I wouldn't even have those. So, I mean, like to me, the Silk Road is pretty sweet, uh, and was a really cool, you know, sort of libertarian experiment in letting people transact. And you know, that's that's my opinion from a, a very, very particular political perspective. But the the overall question is: is can they be abused? Yes. Do I think that the value to society of having a peer-to-peer, -peer, completely decentralized, borderless system of money that is you know, way more efficient than we've ever seen, I think that value will always far outweigh uh, the bad things that can come along with it. Does that answer your question? I love this. I actually like, I like that you're saying that. Yeah. Because I'm a big fan of just different views. Because, I mean, typically, you're dealing with IR and ISF majors, which typically see the other side of that, you know, of that coin, which is very much against it. And we tend to look at things in terms of them being a problem and trying to fix the problem, as opposed to what good could 
possibly come yeah. out of it because it's not our job. You know, if it's good, it's good. That's great. But we deal with what's bad. Graduate, you know? join the so, FBI and look into me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and there are a few people that are interested in that here, actually. So, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, but no, thank you. I like that. I like this. I love this kind of thing. Do we have any other uh, any other questions? What do you major in? Uh, so I was a computer science major. My, I did specifically computing and information science with a focus on, on core CS. So I studied everything that I needed to know to be a software engineer. That's, that's my background. Can you, can you tell us a little more, because we talked about this at some point, but you work for Microsoft, which is a big international organization. And we talked a little bit about you know, what kind of personality do they need, just in general, not necessarily one that is specific to you know, CS or to being a software engineer, but just when working in such an organization like Microsoft, you know, a little bit more about like the culture of such an organization, what skills you think are necessary for uh, students that would be interested to go into organizations like Microsoft or Google or Amazon or any of these big corporations. Uh, two big ones I can think that are in interrelated in terms of just sort of character traits that are very important to an organization like Microsoft. Number one is open-minded. Um, and again, I think you can appreciate that as people, you know, study international relations. Uh, you're dealing with a very international culture. You're dealing with people from all over the world, from all walks of life, as your coworkers, all with the same mission. Uh, so it's very important to be open-minded when it comes to cultures, technologies, everything like that, just in general. Uh, the other one, which is interrelated, is just a, like a, a you know a love of learning. Uh, Microsoft has sort of an internal slogan for its employees, and it's that we all need to have a growth mindset. And that you know sounds like a cliche platitude. I can tell you they take that really seriously. Everything about you know the way that we're reviewed as employees, about uh, the culture that we're trying to drive forward when we build these products is you have to have a growth mindset. So if you're somebody that's coming in and you're not like the rock star engineer or the rock star translator or anything, that those phrases that get thrown around, especially in tech, it is far more important that you come in with a desire to put your feet on the ground every day and learn something new and face new challenges. So if you're the type of person that likes to be out of your comfort zone a little bit, that's a, actually a very, very valuable skill for an international company. So that is, that's my, been my experience at Microsoft specifically. I can't necessarily speak for the other, like Google and all that sort of thing, but in, in general, I think the tech culture is your you're working on something that's changing so rapidly, and that goes for technology and for things that are just happening on an international scale, period. So you need to have the character of being adaptable and, and willing to uh, explore things that are outside of your bubble, so to speak. Did you get any questions related to that in your interview? Like, were there any specific questions in which you could you know, put yourself out there and sort of demonstrate that I specifically said a lot in my intern interview so when I got in there four four, it was it? like four years ago I started working for them so okay. um, I said look I'm not I, I'm gonna be honest with you I'm not necessarily the rock star coder um, you know there are people that are sort of known in our industry as head down hands on the keyboard they are just so so good at writing code mm -hmm. um, but I advocated for myself and my set of soft skills is like, I might not be the best programmer in the world, but I really like to learn, I really like to push myself. Um, I'm good at talking to people and uh, communicating, which is a big skill because you do everything in teams, mm -hmm. you know, as a real world software engineer. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, I mean, they, they bring those kind of things up as you know, how did you, you know, what's, what's it like when you solve a problem with somebody and you can even just put out there if they don't bring it up, like, hey, I, I really like to push myself. I want to be in a position where I have to learn a lot, and that, that stuff matters. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. Anything else? Questions, folks. Somebody asked me about buying drugs with Bitcoin. Like, let's get some more interesting questions <laughs> like that. That's not what I asked. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say. <laughs> so, question is, Yes, so that is a, a question that I've heard a couple times. It's a really good and important question. Um, here's my thoughts on it. I actually had a, a great friend that I met at the Denver Blockchain Conference who is an electrical engineer. He did a very extensive presentation on mining energy consumption and comparing it to other things. 
Uh, so there's a lot of research out there that's going into this. My takeaway and the takeaway of many people that care about this technology is don't look at like Bitcoin mining is taking up as much energy as Switzerland or whatever. Look at the broader scale. How much money do we consume running every single bank, every single bank branch, the Federal Reserve, you know, armored trucks that spew out fumes as they go down the street. Uh, imagining a culture in which decentralized, blockchain-based, peer-to-peer forms of money are the norm rather than fiat currencies. It does take up a lot of energy to do proof-of-work mining, but it is by far the most secure sort of consensus algorithm, right? So proof-of-work is done to ensure that everybody on this network is in agreement about transactions, all that sort of thing. I know it's kind of technical, but it's, it's really, really good at doing that and keeping things secure. And the scale of Bitcoin's energy consumption compared to everything else that's currently being used as money is it like doesn't even compare. So if everybody in the world was using a proof of work, you know, backed cryptocurrency, you know, you'd have a lot of banks that weren't sucking up maxes, massive amounts of power to run, you know, air conditioning and that sort of thing. You have to look at the, and Bitcoin mining also is less than even gold mining. So when you even talk about like, going back to like the gold standard or something like that. I mean, the amount of money that it takes just to dig precious things out of the ground that we can use uh, as money is uh, comparable or more resource intensive than something like Bitcoin is. So does that, does, I mean, does that answer your question? My opinion is, is like, when you look at it comparatively, it doesn't even matter. The, the use cases, people say Bitcoin wastes energy. So the proof of work algorithm doesn't like do anything that's super helpful, like fold proteins or something like that. You know, like do any sort of interesting map other than just this hashing problem. And again, that's technical stuff. But is securing a completely censorship-resistant peer-to-peer borderless global decentralized form of money that is far better than what we have now in certain metrics valuable? To me, that's nowhere near waste. Great question down here, right? Oh, yes. Um, there are some people, okay, to me personally, have no okay. They've like I've heard about Bitcoin probably in Big Bang Theory, like that's as much as yeah. I know about Bitcoin. <laughs> and from my perception, it looks like a rich people kind of thing because all the things I've been seeing is like this. Big people like okay, and drug dealers because that I was watching a series that they were doing a trade with Bitcoin. <laughs> and a, a person like me, can I go to Walmart with this Bitcoin? What is this Bitcoin? So I'm, I'm really glad you she asked. She brings up this. a very good point, though. Yeah. I mean, it is a rich people thing. Like, you're not going to have people. In so, the this is actually, I'm really glad you asked me this because this is something that, as a person that is really, you know, not monetarily invested in Bitcoin, but as a, pa as a passion project, drives me up a freaking wall, is people love to focus on the price. So to, to answer your question at a really high level, Bitcoin is a currency. It's a currency that's created on the internet using a sort of peer-to-peer -peer network, like people just running software. It's not a currency that's issued by a bank or a, or a central government. But really, fundamentally, it's a currency. It's like the US dollar to the euro. How do you get it? Like, if I work Am I paid with bitcoins? Am you I could be. That, that is a thing that has existed in some niche cases. The easiest way to get it is to uh, get it on an online exchange. So much like you can go to a currency exchange and exchange your US dollars for Japanese yen when you're in Japan, you can exchange your US dollars, your euros for bitcoin, for bitcoin cash, ethereum, all these currencies. Um, so what people love to get really hung up on is the price of one bitcoin to the US dollar, which historically has like really crazy skyrocketed. Like one Bitcoin to the US dollar was at one point, you know, fractions of a penny. It's now thousands of dollars. And you know, they're fractional. You can buy a fraction of a Bitcoin, right? It's not just like you have to spend one Bitcoin to get a coffee. You know, it, it gets, it's really subdivisible. But people get all excited about this. People are like, yeah, invest in it. Like you're gonna be rich. And I, I, I could not possibly care less about that, seriously. like. I play around with Bitcoin. I buy it to use it. I use it as a currency. AT&T, the phone company, accepts Bitcoin as a form of payment now. 
Um, there's a fork of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Cash that I use and focus on. It's really designed to be used as a day-to-day -day currency. So I pay my phone bill every month in Bitcoin Cash. I use it to buy goods and services. I have my laptop, my phone that are sitting right here, I bought with Bitcoin Cash. There is this debate in the community about whether or not it's just supposed to be a store of value that lets you get rich and sort of hedge against the US dollar collapsing or something. I think that's useless and uninteresting, I really do. I think this is designed to be a, a currency. And, and you're asking about, you know, sort of, is this for wealthy people? The true, incredible, valuable use case of Bitcoin that I think is what's going to make the difference is banking the unbanked. There are many, many people in the world that do not have access to privileged banking like we do here in the US and Europe, right? Any of us can walk down to a bank branch, hand them some forms of ID, get a checking account, you can check your balance online, you get a debit card, you can swipe anywhere, awesome. Most of the world doesn't live like that. There are many places where, believe it or not, the nearest bank branch is 100 miles away, but they have cell phone towers. Because cell phones have become ubiquitous around the world. All you need to store Bitcoin Cash, to transact with a friend in a, in a local market or anything like that, is a cell phone with a data connection. You know, without, again, going into the technical details, the way that this is designed to use is you are your own bank in Bitcoin. You download a software application. That application stores secret keys that are your control of the money. There is no institution that you have to deal with. There's no bank. There's no central government. It is truly peer-to-peer, -peer, me to you. And so the real use case that is valuable is bringing financial sovereignty over your own money to people in the world that don't have access to that now. Because, again, there are so many places in the world where you can have a cell phone and a data connection, but you can't have a bank account. And you're dealing with cash, and it's dangerous. And that, to me, is the truth. I don't want to go on and on about this, but you can tell that this is a, a thing that touches me particularly hard, right? So my vision for cryptocurrencies is every day when you get up and you go to Starbucks and you buy your morning coffee and you buy your books for school, that you are transacting with a cryptocurrency. Because ultimately that means everybody in the world is more in control over their own money. Um, it can be censored. It can be sent anywhere in the world for fractions of a penny instantaneously. And the power of that is extraordinary. So, I think that um, while it is unfortunate that much of the focus has come on the wealthy and the ability to speculate on cryptocurrencies as, as assets, um, I think the true, value, the true value of it goes um, is really for the people that don't have much. And that's where it's going to impact the most as we see adoption continue. So sorry for the very long answer, but no, it's, okay. it's um, Thank you. yeah, there are a lot of people out there that are working on that and focusing on that. And they don't get as much attention as the speculators, the people that had it in 2013 and then went and bought a Lamborghini with it. I mean, the, the people that are, are working on it as a transactional currency don't get the attention, but they're, they're doing the good work out there in the background. They just don't make it into Big Bang Theory, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Josh, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. Out of time. <laughs>